How's everybody doing today? Doing well. Let's open our Bibles, please, to James chapter 1. So we continue our study through the Word of God. James chapter 1. And we'll be reading and studying verses 19 through 21 this morning. Let's go ahead and read that and then we'll pray together. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. So then, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we come. uh, We turn away from those things. Lord, may we be quick to hear even now, Lord Jesus. And may your implanted word just be received with meekness in each one of our hearts this morning, Lord, by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we come here uh, to James chapter 1 here in verse 19, these these are good words for anyone, uh, you know, as far as Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Amen? Amen. Amen. And these are actually, you know, backed up throughout the scripture. As Christians, we are to be, you know, slow or quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But as James is continuing to teach the early church, you know, basically what it truly means to walk the Christian walk, these instructions go a little deeper. And if you look back at verse 18, you remember that we are the first fruits of his creation brought forth, forth by the word of truth. And, it's, and notice it says, So then, because of this, my beloved brothers, here in verse 19, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I'm sure there'll be many wives poking their husbands during this study. Many husbands poking their wives or children. You know, hey mom, hey dad, did you hear that? Or kids, hey, did you hear that, kids? But may each one of us hear this for ourselves because notice how he he points it there. Notice how he says, let every person. So this isn't just for the hotheads, amen? This isn't just for the Irish or the Italian or the whatever, you know, we we might make excuses for, you know, our hot-headedness or quick to anger or, or not to listen. But these are for every person. All of us are to continually be, you know, to be being quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You know, as we look through these verses, there's actually four important steps for us as Christians that uh, James is going over as we come to hear the Word of God. And that's actually the main subject here is the hearing of the Word of God to be quick to hear the word of God, slow to speak, slow to anger. And lastly, we're going to see in verse 21 that actually be cultivating our hearts to receive the word of God with meekness. Now, the first three listed are here in verse 19. Let every person, and again, thus this is speaking to all of us, that we're to be quick to hear. And that's the first thing that he calls us to be, quick to hear the word of God. Now, again, this can apply to relationships. I I don't know about you, but have you ever been talking with someone and realized that they've actually been talking to you for a minute or two and you haven't heard a word they said? Why is that? Well, we're thinking about uh, numerous different things. We might be talking about or thinking about in our head how what we're going to reply to them. So we heard the first few words, and then we kind of dropped out because we're putting together our reply to them. Maybe we're thinking about the hard day at work or we see the kids over there just about to dump over, you know, something of milk or whatever. And we're just not honing in on each other. Husbands and wives can have an amen. Amen. How about when, when you're talking to your kids? Did you hear a word I said? Did you hear me? What? What did you say, Dad? Why? You didn't hear me? So again, it can apply in those situations. But especially here that we need to be those who are quick to hear the word of God. Now the word quick here in the Greek literally means speedy, nimble, quick to hear the word of God. Now the opposite of this would in the Greek is literally to be dull or slow 
to hear the word of God. Now, I firmly believe that one of the major maladies within the church today is so many of us are actually, instead of being quick to hear the word of God, we're dull, we're slow to hear the word of God. We're slow to hear God's word. We're not attentive to, to God and to his word. Jesus said in, in Luke 8, 18, take care then how you hear. He said in Matthew 13, 13, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. How many Sundays have we gone home after church and, and, and within five minutes we forget every word that was even said? Amen? Come on, so, I mean, Amen. You know, sometimes I remember hearing Alistair Begg talking a few years ago, and he said, it'll amaze me. Somebody will come up, oh, I heard you had the greatest sermon five years ago. It was so awesome. Well, what was it about? Oh, I don't remember what it was about, but you told the funniest story about, you know, this guy. And, blah, blah, and they'd go on, and he's like, dude, man, you didn't even hear what I was teaching about, but you remember that thing. So we need to be, instead of those, as Jesus said, we need to be those who, instead of hearing and do not hear, when we come to the Word of God. And this, is, this can be in the church setting when we're listening to the Word. It can be when we're having our private devotions and we're reading the Word of God or studying God's Word. It can be when we have the radio on or we have our you know, iPhone on or something and, and we're listening to a pi podcast. But we need to be those who are attentive to what we're hearing. Do you know what? I probably already lost some of you here this morning. That's the, you know, it's funny when you, you, you look at the studies, like how, how often do people, um, how long can they listen for? And for certain people, it's different ways. But for a lot of us, it's getting shorter and shorter periods of time. You know, do you ever notice watching, you know, television, how shorter and shorter it is to the commercial breaks? It's getting shorter and shorter. And, and even the, the scenes, if you watch a scene, it goes quicker and quicker because they know that they start to lose the attention. But we need to be those who are attentive to the Word of God. Those who come with a purpose, even as we come to church, a purpose. I am going to hear from God through His Word. Even if the pastor is a bonehead like Bill Henry, I'm going to hear from God through His Word because at least He'll be reading God's Word to us and I can hear God through His Word. You see, there are many today within the church who profess Christ, they say they're Christians, yet they never seem to grow spiritually. And perhaps that is how it is with some of us sitting here today. There are many who profess Christ, yet never read their Bibles. And perhaps that's true with some of us sitting here today. But it is also possible, we are told in the book of Hebrews, to be a Christian and yet to be dull of hearing. To be dull of hearing, again, to be slow. And not really, it doesn't really get through because there's so many other things going on. Let's actually turn there real quick, please, to Hebrews chapter 5. Just the next book back to the left in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 5. And let's look at this. Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. Hebrews 5, 11. About this we have much to say. And it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Notice, just briefly, notice these people, they, they didn't start out that way, they became dull of hearing. And look at what he says, he goes on to say what the result is in verse 12. For although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have powers of discernment trained by constant patience to distinguish good from evil. One of the fruits in our lives of not being quick to hear the word of God is to become dull. There are many Christians today who exemplify this. Even with, within our fellowship here, you've been walking with the Lord a long time. You've been a Christian for a long time, but, but you're still, there's still a dullness of hearing. You should be able to teach people God's word. We should be able to teach him. And, and we're not at that place. Instead, you know, we're, we're, we're sucking on that big, big bottle of milk. And we need to understand it comes back because we're not attentive to hearing the word of God. 
Now, a lot of us may not understand either the ways, the, the main way that God speaks to us. You know, the main way that we listen to God is not simply through taking a walk through a forest, not simply by going down to the beach and hearing the waves crashing on the, you know, on the beach or in any other way. The main way that we hear from God is through the continual, habitual, daily reading of the Word of God. Can I have an amen? Amen? Amen. 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 The continual, daily, habitual reading of the Word of God. Now, most of us will say amen, but how many of us actually do it? Don't raise your hands, but how many of us actually are doing it? We're in the Word every day, allowing God to speak to us, allowing our hearts to be softened by the Holy Spirit so we can hear, because in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Can we hear it from the Lord when we're walking at the beach? Of course we can. We have His Holy Spirit living within us. Can we hear him when we're walking on the golf course or walking through the woods? Of course we can. But that is not the main way that we hear from God. The second part of that is even if we are reading our Bibles every day, even if we come on Sunday mornings, are we listening for God? Are we expecting him to speak? I remember hearing a guy teach years ago, and it was so awesome because he's like, dude, do you come to church to expecting God to speak? When you wake up in the morning and you're getting up early, it's like, do you get excited because you're expecting God to speak? I, I was telling somebody, I read about a, an, a, an older saint, you know, he went home to be with the Lord many years ago, but he, he was saying that, like in a biography that when every time he wake up in the morning, he literally would dance around his room because he was so excited to go and spend time with his Jesus. And I'll be honest, I read that at first, and I was like, dude, that guy's a kook, man. That's like wacky. <laughs> but imagine being so excited, Lord. It's like, yeah, baby, I'm doing a little Irish jig. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm so excited to spend time with my Jesus. And to be honest, I can relate to that a little bit. I love when my eyes first pop up. It's like, boop. Oh, good morning, Lord. I'm here for another day. Thank you, Lord. Thank, you know what? Your mercies are new today. I better, I'm going to confess everything, make sure I get everything done. Confess, because your mercies are new. I'm partaking of them. I can't wait to go and just meet you in your word. And as I come to the word of God, and as I come in prayer, it's not because I'm somebody, whatever. No, it's because he is somebody. He will meet us through his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But we need to be attentive. We need to be quick to hear. And it's interesting you know, we need to hear God. The word hear there in the Greek literally means to hear with attention. And we know the difference, don't we? You ever listen to your kids and they're all over there and there's just a mundane whatever, you're working on this and you just hear the mundane. You hear them, but you don't hear them. You're not hearing with attention. But all of a sudden you hear that certain cry. Whoa, something's going on. There can be like a whole field full of kids, but you hear that, right? Mom or dad, and you just know, boom, that's my kid. Where are they? And you go. But you're not hearing with attention. A lot of times when we listen to each other, we, you know, might come home. It's like, hey, honey, how was your day? Oh, it was great. And we start sharing our day, and all of a sudden we're zoning off in the twilight zone. You know? And then all of a sudden it's like the next thing, you know, sometimes, it, or maybe sometimes it's when we're going to sleep at night. So tell me, how are you doing? Da, da, da. Oh, well, let me tell you. And they're going off for a few minutes. Next thing you're... <laughs> well, I guess I'll be quiet now. <laughs> and I'll go to sleep. <laughs> They're not listening with attention. So what this is saying here in the Greek is literally, we need to be quick, speedy, nimble to listen with attention to God. Yeah, we need to do that with our wives and our husbands and our kids and our parents and our friends and, and the lost, but we need to be especially doing this with God. Now, there are many things today that can help us or, or actually in, discourage us from being quick to hear from God, to being nimble, to be hearing, to be attentive. You know, televisions, computers, cell phones, even books sometimes, hobbies, concerts, work, school, even kids and family. They can all become things that are so distracting to us. And again, in the right place, in the right biblical place, they're all good, they're all fine, they're all healthy, or can be healthy, but the point is this, is they can be so, so many things vying for our attention. I remember being a kid growing up. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, okay? So yes, I'm an old guy. But 
man, I remember there wasn't so many distractions. Even when we got home from school, you know, if we, if we were lucky on channel 50 or 52, whatever it was, some off channel, there was no cartoons on TV. We had like five or six channels back then. And, but if we're lucky, we could get Kimba the White Lion or Gumby, you know, or some of these, you know, maybe we got the Little Rascals. But to be honest, there's no, nothing really vying for our attention. So it would be, hey, let's go and see if Johnny and Joe can play down the street. Let's go get Scott McIntyre and let's go play Hot Wheels. Let's, there was not all these distractions. Today, Dude, it's distractions left and right, everything. Man, even like, you know one thing, I, I, just, I, had, I, I, hate, I, I don't hate text messaging, but text messaging can drive me nuts. Because at least with the cell phone, you can turn it off and they get a message. Hi, I'm not here, please leave a message. But somebody texts you, and you're like, you know, you might be in the middle of, you know, I'm, you know, oh, the pastor, I'm going to kill us. Wait, I got a text here, just, just one minute. <laughs> And they're all, you know, and, and you can't like auto reply with the text. Hey, I'm busy. I'll call you. And, you know, if you, if you do this, I'll be back to you in a day or, you know, a few hours. But it's like, so, but it, what does it do? It cries out for our attention. There's emails coming down on the phone. There's phone calls. There's text messages. There's, you know, people that are actually alive around you, like they're in person wanting your attention. And we're just like going crazy. And the, young, the younger you are, the more you're kind of, you know, fluid in this. So I can flow from this into that. And, and the older we are, it gets a little harder. But man, everything is are trying to, to, to take our attention. As the Twitter key, feed keeps on flowing, the Instagram, you know, feed is constantly shifting. The Facebook feed is endless and ever moving. Amen? And the next thing you know, as you're looking through these things, we're distracted. And, and even if we had spent time with the Lord, instead of meditating day and night upon it, we all of a sudden become, can become distracted from it. So we need to be careful. We need to be those who, when we sit down to read the Word of God, that we hone in. Because even with all these distractions, do you ever find that sometimes it's hard to do that? It's like, okay, you know, do, 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 do. I got this time, and so I'm going to read here for you. Do, 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 do. Okay, I did what Pastor Bill said. I read two chapters, I'm all done. Instead of, Lord, how would you speak to me? Oh, look at this verse right here. Whoa, check it out. And it's just like, boom, it comes out, and it's just ministering to your heart. You were just praying about this 10 minutes ago. This is awesome, Lord, you just said this. And, you know, and I love it being married, you know, to a godly woman and having godly kids. It's like, dude, check this out. Look what the Lord just showed me. Isn't this awesome? And they're like, oh, that's rad. And you get excited. And we, we meditate on that, and, we, and we, we let ourselves be captivated by it instead of distracted by other things. Quick to hear the Word of God. Quick to hear. Quick to listen. You know, just one quick thing, a little side note on this, if you will. So many of us, we come to, to God's Word, and we might even listen, but do we listen to respond? Notice that's how we're to be listening. To be listening, reading, studying the Word of God and, and be in response to it. You know, basically, you know, a lot of us think that we don't have to listen to it at all, that God should be honored by the fact that I said, yes, I'm a Christian, you know, 20 years ago. I don't need to be in your Word because I know good enough. I don't need to listen to you anymore. And we actually turn into kind of the spoiled little kid than the humble servant and child of our King. Amen? We need to watch out for that heart. It's so easy to kind of creep in in all of us. You, you see, instead of being quick to listen, a lot of us can be quick to speak. Look at the second thing it says here. So we need to be quick to listen, and secondly, we need to be slow to speak. Slow to speak. I remember being in seminary years ago, and you know, one of my spiritual heroes was Chuck Smith, pastor down there at Calvary Coast in Mesa, and I was in there, and we'd have Chuck every morning. We'd have Chuck from uh, nine, eight to, or 9 to 10, and we'd have David Hawking on Fridays from 7 to 9. Dude, I was so excited. It was like I was going to Disneyland every Friday. It was awesome. But I remember I started to ask Pastor Chuck a question. And right in the middle of my question, he cut me off, and he kind of was slightly offended by the question and, because he took it to a different place. And I could tell he must have been offered, asked that other question a hundred times. And he got, he got kind of offended, and I'm like, I'm sitting there, well, do I, uh, Lord, do I, you know, correct my pastor in front of this whole class, or do I just be quiet and just humbly swallow it? So I just was quiet, humbly swallowed it, we moved on. But he was kind of a little quick to speak. He wasn't slow to speak. You see, we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. Now, what's interesting here is, 
You know, remember what we said in the Greek that to be quick to listen and the opposite is to be slow? This is the actual opposite word here in the Greek. We need to be quick to listen but slow to speak. To slow down. Before the words, we just find them blurting out of our mouth. Amen? Dude, I remember years ago, my brother Bob wrote a song and he said, Sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can really hurt you. You see, you can't take words back. We might go and ask for forgiveness, and there's forgiveness, but, you know, there, there's still that. Those words can still sting with us for the rest of our lives. Amen? The enemy can use them. You know, oh, you're this, you're that. You'll never amount to anything. But when we come to the Lord especially, we need to be those, yes, Lord, speak, Lord, your servant listeneth. Yes, that is my heart. And then instead of like when you start speaking to us, oh, well, Lord, wait a minute, you got to hear what I got to say. And sadly, a lot of us can be like that. And, and I think it can be our tendency because, you know, let's be honest, we're pretty important, aren't we? I'm the most important person in my life. Shouldn't be that way. But in my flesh, that's how we can act. And we can come to the Lord as he's right in the middle of telling us something. Oh, wait a minute. You ever had somebody, you're, you go to somebody, oh, you should have heard this thing that happened to me. It was really bad. And then right in the middle of it, somebody, they cut you off, the person that's listening to you, and they say, oh, well, you should have seen what happened to me 20 years ago. Let me tell you about that. And you're sitting there like, oh, I guess they don't care you know, about what I feel or what's going on. And we can do that, though, with the Lord. When we're, when we're quick to speak instead of being slow to speak, when we're slow to listen and being quick to, to speaking, and all of a sudden it, it stops being God is the God of our lives and we become the God of our lives. Very sad thing happens there. You see, when God is speaking to us through his word, whether we be reading it, studying it, listening to it, hearing it in a sermon, we are to be quick to listen and slow to speak. So in other words, when the Lord is speaking to us, we don't say things like, well, Lord, I know the Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah were ex destroyed for you know, being exceedingly wicked, but I know you're a God of love, and a God of love would never do something like that. When we're quick to speak and slow to listen, we say things like, well, Lord, I know the Bible says that I'm to lead my home as a husband, I, you know, to love my wife and to lead her in all ways, especially uh, spiritually, but I know that I'm not very, a very good leader. You know, so by the way, Lord, my wife knows this too. So I'm just going to let her lead. That's what we'll say. Or when we're quick to speak and slow to listen to the Lord, we'll say, well, Lord, I know the Bible says that a woman is not to teach or have authority over man in the church, but I know that it's your word is, you know, is antiquated. And, and I don't really need to listen, you know, because what I know is better than what your word says. That's what happens when we're, we're quick to speak instead of being slow to speaking. Again, the one who's quick to speak says, well, Lord, I know the Bible says that you created the world in six days, but I know that evolution must be real, so I say that part of your word is wrong. It just wasn't six literal days. It kind of was, you know, we don't know really how long those days were. And because I'm saying what I know, in all those cases, all those scenarios, and by the way, all those cases and scenarios I've heard people say right to my face, Right to my face. And again, these are, you know, again, not what God has said, but what people have said. So instead of being quick to hear what God says through his word, we're quick to hear what I have to say about the subject. I remember when I first came to Christ, I, I was in a, in a Christian church that, that didn't promote the word of God. And when I finally came, you know, started going to Calvary and, and, and Chuck and Greg Laurie and others were, you know, Randy Ziegler were teaching through the word of God. It was foreign to me. And to be honest, some of it was quite boring. Amen? Hey, I was that, I was that Christian, that baby Christian. I'd been a Christian for seven years at that point. Thought I was Mr. Spiritual Dude and everything. But then when I started reading through the word of God, I came to that place where it's like, you know what, Lord? I don't even know why I believe what I believe anymore. Why, what do I believe about abortion? What do I believe about homosexuality? What do I believe about sex outside of marriage? What do I believe about drugs and alcohol and cussing? And what do I believe about, you know, dirty jokes? I mean, just everything, Lord. Did I learn it when watching Romper Room when I was a kid? You know, did I hear about it from my teacher at school or the kids on the playground? 
that I learned some of it while I was in church. And I had to come to that point and humble myself before God and say, Lord, speak, Lord, your servant listeneth. I'm done talking. I need to hear you talk. I need to change my thoughts, my life to in accordance to your word. You see, the people that we're just talking about are, are those people who have a tendency to be quick to speak and slow to listen and care not what the Lord says. In other words, we speak for the Lord. Whenever you hear somebody say, well, my God is not a God of condemnation. My God is not a God, you know, who, a God of retribution. I remember Oprah Winfrey, you know, she says she used to be a Christian. And she said when she was reading in the Bible that God is jealous over his people. She said, well, my God isn't, doesn't get jealous. She thought that was a flaw, and she walked away from Christianity. Now she has some grotesque, cultish, whatever. But do you notice what, what it was? She spoke what she believed. She wasn't quick to listen and slow to speak. She was short to listen and quick to speak, and, and a lot of us can be that way. We like to speak for the Lord. And even though things are, can be quite unbiblical and sinful to do, we presume that we know better than God does within his word. We presume that we know better than God does in his word. And there, this is permeating the church today. Lord, I know you want me to go to church today, but, you know, but I know that you really don't mind at all if I don't go. So I'm not going to go. Lord, I know that I should be reading my Bible every day, but I know that you really don't care. I know you don't mind. It's all good with you. That's me speaking. That's not God. Lord, I know, you know, I should be sharing the gospel with people, and it's been a long time since I've told anybody, you know, the, the way of salvation, but I know your grace covers all that. You don't really care if I go out and make disciples. You can have an Amen. Hey, it's so easy for all of us to start speaking for God. Instead of being quick to listen, we become quick at speaking. Well, I, this is what my God says. Well, that's not the God of the Bible. So that's not God at all. Can I have an amen? Amen? Amen. amen. If it's not said in his word and we have the audacity to say, well, this is what my God says, we're in trouble. We're in sin. We're committing heresy. And we need to be those who aren't afraid to stand up and say that, by the way. This is what God's word says, and I will contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You see, because when we start getting in opinions about sin and what I say about it, what you say about it, the Bible says in Proverbs 10, 19, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. That's the New Living Translation. Isn't that great? Too much talk, man. A lot of talk leads to sin. So first of all, we see we're to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and third, look here with me, slow to anger. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and then thirdly, slow to anger. And again, this is great advice while we're in a marriage, when we're dealing with our kids, when we're at work, at school. But the main application again is, you know, we need to be those who do not become angry with the word of God. Not quick to anger. You know, there are many who profess Christ who get angry with the word of God. <sighs> Lord, you know that if we tithe at the very, you know, at the very least what your word says, then, uh, you know, you know there's no way that we're going to make it. I can't do this. And we get mad at God for saying, hey, you know what? Do this, test me, and I'll pour the very storehouses upon you. But we get mad at him. Or we say, Lord, I know you want me to submit to my husband as unto you, but he's going to blow it. He always does, Lord. I can't do this. And we get mad at God. Sometimes you get mad at the messenger, which is me. It doesn't matter. I'm just the messenger. Or other times, Lord, if you really love me, you wouldn't allow trials in my life. How dare you? And we are quick to get angry with God. We stop listening. We start speaking. And then we start getting angry. So many times, you know, as we may hear God's word, you know, and again, we're slow to speak, may perhaps, but then we get angry with God, what God clearly tells us through his word. You see, the, the complete opposite of these three is to be slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to anger. Now, we need to understand that there is also a godly anger, 
an anger against sin that we read of in, in Ephesians chapter 4. But we also see in uh, Psalm 97, 10, it says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. We are to hate sin. We are to hate sin, by the way, first and foremost in our own lives. Amen? I don't know about you, but it's always easier to hate some sin in somebody else's life. Oh, you guys shouldn't be doing that. What are you doing at home? Uh, that doesn't matter. You shouldn't be doing it. No, dude, we need to hate sin first and foremost in our own lives. And it's okay that we get angry with the sin even within our society and we see it permeating. But we need to be careful with our anger because look at verse 20. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Man, I tell you, we, we need to be careful. We need to be slow to anger. Hey, you just read about something somebody said? You know, President Obama said this, or you know, Hillary Clinton said that, or you know, Bush said this, or uh, you know, somebody else, Trump said that. And we, we can be so quick to get, to get angry. But again, especially when we come to the Word of God. There's no room for anger against God. I'm not saying we don't take it to Him and we confess it, but it doesn't produce the righteousness that God requires. I like what one person said about being angry and, you know, with righteousness and being careful with all that, but also angry against sin. He said, the person who cannot get angry at sin does not have much strength to fight it. So we need to be angry with sin, especially, again, within our own lives. We need to, hey, dude, you're not coming back in this door. By the power of the Holy Spirit of God, I'm going to stand on the Word of God, and I'm going to claim victory over this sin. And I know that God is going to make a way for me to, to, to either endure that sin or make a way of escape. Because I believe God more than I believe that temptation to sin. The anger of man... You know, I don't know about you, but this, we live in a world that is easy to get angry at a lot of things. Amen? Can I have an amen? Amen. amen. And I'm sure we could each go around and there's different things. I'm mad at my teacher. I'm mad at my boss. I'm mad at my parents. I'm mad at my children. I'm mad at, you know, our local politicians. I'm mad at, you know, this guy because he just said that. Gal just said that. And we can be angry. The Bible says, you know, that in the last days, because lawlessness is increasing, Jesus said, the love of many will wax cold grow cold and become can become angry it can become bitter it can become hardened we need to be careful because our anger does not produce the righteousness that god requires but especially when we come to the word of god and we read something that we don't like we read something perhaps about a pet sin of ours you know right now there's a huge pet sin and i know we preach a lot about this but the church is continually being attacked by homo homosexuality continually being attacked. We have pastors that are either, either embracing it. We have churches and denominations. You know, a church just said last week, one of the oldest churches in America, I think it's called the First Baptist Church, or I always forget, you know, there was all the Baptists, sorry, there's so many different Baptist churches. But it's back east, it's in the south, and basically it was, I think it was founded in 1827, but they just came out last week and said, we're going to embrace homosexuality, we're going to embrace the transgender, we're going to even put them in our pulpits. And I love what Franklin Graham said. He goes, you're not embracing homosexuality and transgender. You're embracing sin. Now that becomes a pet peeve with some people. So when they read in the Bible, and they read where it very clearly says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it says clearly in uh, Galatians chapter 5, Romans chapter 1, and in other places throughout the word of God, that this is sin and those who practice it will not inherit the kingdom of God. They get angry at God's word. And so you have guys who, who declare themselves to be Greek scholars or gals who declare themselves to be Greek scholars and they come in and they try to twist and to turn and to say, well, that wasn't necessarily within the Greek text, the manuscripts throughout the years. I had one fella years ago sit right across from me, man, Robert, great guy. Loved, well, you know, he loved his sin more than he loved the Lord. But he's saying, yeah, well, through the centuries, you know, the, you know, the Bible's been changed by people who are homophobic. And I said, dude, you know, that might fly in certain camps, but you see, I'm in a camp where we can actually go and look at the copies of the manuscripts, you know, that are almost 2,000 years old. And, and, and by the way, you can look at you can compare them through the centuries, and guess what? They have, it hasn't been added. We can go back and look at some manuscripts from 100 AD, and guess what? 
it hasn't been added. Because he just said, oh, probably around five or six, maybe the 1500s it was added. No, it wasn't, bro. We can go back. We have the evidence. But again, that was his pet sin. Maybe the pet sin is alcoholism or, or drunkardness, as the Bible calls it. Well, I was born this way, and so, you know, uh, just nothing I can do about it. You can repent of it because the Bible says it's sin. So we get mad at the sin or the Bible, or we get mad at the person who preaches the Bible. We, you know, we get mad when people even stand up and say you need to repent. Well, that's what the Bible says. That's what God says we need to do to enter his kingdom. Repent from our sins. Well, that's pretty unloving of you, Pastor. Well, then it must be pretty unloving of God in your view. But I think it's the greatest of all loves. That Jesus Christ died for our sins upon the cross. He paid the debt that we could not pay because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he died for our sins and as we repent of them, feel sorry for them, a godly sorrow, the Bible says, and we turn away from them and turn to God and confess our sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are born again of the Spirit of God. Can I have an amen? amen. That's an amen. But people don't like that message. So they hate the word of God. They get mad. And it doesn't produce a righteous anger. Look at verse 21. So we see that we're to be quick to listen, we're to be slow to speak, we're to be slow to anger, and lastly, we're to clean, we're to cultivate our lives, our hearts, even as Christians. Remember, he's writing to Christians, beloved. So this applies to us. This doesn't, well, that's for everybody out there. Therefore, verse 21, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Put away. Now, there in the Greek, it's basically a derivative of two different Greek words, and it means to cast off, to lay aside, to put away, to put off from oneself. If you look at it up in the Greek, it's a very interesting thing in the New Testament. There's one time it's used, the first time it's used is when Paul was there, actually he was Saul then, remember when Stephen was being stoned? And they took their coats to, Paul, to Saul and they took them off and they laid him at his feet when they took off. There are coats there that's the same word to take off. We are to lay aside, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to see the same word, put off. It's very interesting, a great study to do, by the way, when you have some extra time. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Ephesians 4.22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. So again, that word put off right there, it's the same exact word in the Greek. We're to be, as Christians, we are to put off our old self, with, which belongs, he goes, continues here, to your former manner of life and is corrupt and deceitful, and it will be, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on, so the opposite word, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. This word put off is used again. <clears throat> Excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside. That's the same Greek word there. Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Remember, the right of Hebrews is writing to Christians too. So it was back in Ephesians. These were all the Christians. Lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Amen? Who for the joy was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen? I love that. It's interesting because every time this word put off is used in the New Testament, it's, it, we, we need to be putting off the old self, putting off sin. In 1 Peter 2, 1, it says, put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy. Same uh, verse is used, or word is used in Colossians. 
chapter 3, verse 8, it says, But you now must now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another. And he goes on. So this word is always used in con conjunction with putting off something evil in our lives. And guess whose responsibility it is? Do you mind raising your hand, please? It's our responsibility. I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to say, Lord, I have these bad things, you know. I have some filthiness or some rampant wickedness, you know, going through my head or these different things, and I get angry or do this or that. And it's like, Lord, you need to change me. Okay, I'm going to bed now, Lord, and you work on that, okay, when we're sleeping. Right? Well, God hasn't changed me yet, so I guess he still wants me to be this way. No, this is our responsibility. I can blame everybody else for my sin. I can look at you and say, well, you know, listen, that I can look at God and say, it's your fault that I'm this way. Or I can repent and by the strength and grace of God believe what the scripture says. Well, I'm enslaved for this sin for the rest of my life. I will never have victory ever again. You're being quick to speak. You're not quick to listen because God says we can have victory over every sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And if God says we can put off, if God is commanding us, by the way, this isn't a suggestion. You know, hey, if you're up to it today, I know you got a hard day in front of you and God's telling you, I know it's a rough day today. I know you've had, you know, if you're up to it, can you please just put aside these things? Okay, thanks. I know if you can, it's okay. But that's how we act. Well, I can't really do this, and I'm going to continue because, you know, I'm under God's grace. Hey, we find power in God's grace. Paul said, don't use God's grace as an excuse to sin. We find later that Paul said, you know what, I work harder than anybody else, but it's not me working, it's the grace of God. God's grace is there, it is real, it saves us, it keeps us, and, but we have victory in Jesus Christ. These things are all of us to do. Let us not coddle our sin and say, well, Jesus just hasn't worked on this yet. No, we have, to, we have to, instead of coddling it, we need to confess it. If God commands us to set aside something, you better believe he's going to empower us to do that. Amen? Amen? God, can, God empowers us, dude. This is one of the false beliefs in the church today. Oh, we're just going wherever, you know, Lord, would, uh, no, dude, man, I am standing on the word of God. I'm going to be quick to listen. Oh, Lord, it's glorious. Okay, you tell me to put away all this, you know, filthiness, literally in the Greek there means dirt, filth, uncleanness, moral filth. Man, I bet some of us that would turn off half the movies and TV we watch. Moral filth. And be careful. Be careful, it's so easy, it sneaks up on us. Amen? Be careful. The word wickedness there, rampant wickedness, that literally means exceeding, or all that remains. And wickedness is naughtiness, outgrowth of wickedness, prevalent evil. We can't partake of the evil things of the world, beloved in Christ, no, no more. Hey, if you're, you go to the movies, you know what? And there's something that starts wicked really. Dude, man, get out. Get out. Turn the channel. You know, delete the song from your, 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 your iPad or whatever. Get rid of it. Just take it and put it off. You know, in Jeremiah 4.3, it says, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. You see, beloved in Christ, as we listen attentively to the word of God, and we're slow to speak, slow to anger, and God's word starts to have its way as we, we, we start to actually obey God's word, we actually start breaking up the fallow ground and sow not among the thorns. I like how the New Living says this in Jeremiah 3. It says, plow up the hard ground of your hearts. Do not waste your good seed among the thorns. You know, it's been said that when we're born again of the Spirit of God, He gives us in our souls basically a garden to tend. And He gives us the tools, He gives us the power, He even gives us the instructions. We need to be those that by His power, we set aside the filth, we set aside the evil, we cultivate the garden within our hearts. And if there is that in your life, confess it to the Lord, repent of it. 
turn away. Let yourself weep over it. Now look what it says. As we put away filthiness and rampant wickedness, and we're quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and we're now ready to receive the word of God into our cultivated hearts. Notice, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. You see, beloved in Christ, it takes meekness. It takes humility to receive the true word of God. I like how one commentator said it. He said, when we receive the word with meekness, we receive it and do not argue with it and honor it as God's word. You do not try and twist or conform it to your way of thinking. That's coming meekly and humbly to the word of God. If you're having problems with sin in your life, beloved in Christ, there's no power of the Spirit in your life. I can guarantee you that you're not, that we're not coming meekly and humbly to the Word of God. Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed into this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect of God. Let me read this in the New Living. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And we know that that comes where? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing... By the word of God. This is how he transforms our minds. If we're quick to listen, if we receive his word with meekness. That means when we come to the Lord, we come as his servants. We are to humble ourselves in the Lord too many times because of who we are in Christ. And we're told that we can approach his throne with boldness. And we can. Amen. We come and say, like, all right, Lord, here I am. You do what I want you to do. I've heard people say that. Lord, you know what? I, I claim in the name of Jesus, a new Mercedes. And you just got to get out there and you just, you know, you use the Holy Spirit. Like, and they talk about it like it's, you know, the force from Star Wars. Use the force, Lou. And it's like, oh, there's the good and the bad. No, that's not it at all. We come and we come boldly into the throne room of grace and we humble ourselves. Lord, here I am. I am your servant, Lord. So blessed to come into your presence. Man, I'm, it's so, did I tell you it's an art? It's, I'm so, ra Bill, relax. Come here. I'm going to lift you up as you humble yourself. That's what we're told. Humble yourselves and he will lift you up. We think sometimes, well, if I come in and, you know, I, I'm just like, oh, Lord, I'm a buzzard, you know, and I'm all this. And by the way, we are. We still are. We're saved, gloriously saved. We're covered by the blood of the Lamb, but we still sin. We still have the ugliness of our sin nature. But as we humble ourselves and we come, Lord, speak, Lord, again, for your servant, servant listeneth. As we come to him, as we study, you know, as we read his word, as we hear his word, and we say that to him, Lord, speak, your servant listeneth, and we come humbly. It's like, you know what, Lord, correct me in my thinking. Correct me in my speech. Correct me in my actions. And I come to the word, and I'm going to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to do what you have here by the power of your spirit. I'm going to receive this with meekness. Lord, I want you to tell me what's right and wrong. I want you to tell me the truth of who you are and who I am. Lord, I want, you know, you are the Lord. I am your servant. You are God. I am your creation. You are our Father. We are your children. Thus take everything we know, everything we think we know and believe, and we need to hold it again to God's word as a mirror. Can I have an amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. And allow his word to correct us. We need to allow God to correct us, to change us, to mold us into the image of Jesus Christ. We don't walk away and ignore the things that we see in the Bible that we don't like. Well, Lord, I don't like the fact that you're telling me to do this or tell me not to do that, so I'm just going to ignore it and I'm going to forget it. I'm going to say that I love you, but that's an, that's an oxymoron. Jesus said, you can't say you love me and not do what I say. John just says, dude, if you say you love God and you don't do what he tells you to do, you're a liar. This is the apostle of love. You see, we receive the word with meekness. The implanted word, which is able to save our souls. 
Now, as we close, we just need to be warned of something very important here. Notice, it says that it is God's word that is able to save our souls. Not our word. Not our friends' words. Not the, you know, the teacher in you know, college or university, the professor. Not the president's words. Not the pastor's words. Not the famous guy or gal's words, that musician that we love or that actor. Act, not their words can save us. Not even the word of the church, but it is the word of God that can save us. Can I have an amen? Amen. This should get us excited. This is, this is where life is found. You know, it's interesting. Those who follow the word of man are those who, you know, they, they are on that wide path. That wide path. Those who say they follow God, I love you, God. I don't care about your word. That's, that, you know, that's antiquated, but I love Jesus. I, you know what? They're on the wide path to destruction. And that's hell, by the way. Hell is real. Hell is eternal. The path that says the word of God is not relevant today, that's the path. That path is the path that says women can preach from the pulpit, that's the path. This is the path that says Jesus is the only, um, only excuse me, is, not, is only one of many ways, that's the path. This is the path that says I don't have to submit to my husband. This is the path that says I don't have to lead my wife or honor my parents. You know, this is the path that says I don't have to go to church. I don't need to read my Bible. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to pray. I am my prayer closet. I don't have to fast. I don't have to obey the word of God. This is the wide path. And that is not the word of God that leads to salvation. The narrow path is actually quite easy to know the way. For God gave it to us in 66 books by some 40 authors. We call it the Bible. This is God's word. This is the narrow path. This tells us how to live righteously, how to love God, how to love others, how to love the lost. See, this is the word, notice here again in our text, that is able to save our souls. May I ask this morning, what path are we on? What a great thing for each one of us that we can still look and say, Lord, which path am I on? And I guarantee you that if you're not on this path, if you're not on the path of the word of God, it will lead you to destruction. But if we are on the path of the word, may I encourage you, beloved in Christ, to go deeper. Go deeper, go higher, go stronger in Jesus. Can you have an amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are the Savior of our souls. You are completely holy, completely just, Lord. You are so worthy of our praise this morning, Lord. And as we read your word, Lord, yeah, I pray that we'd all be, you know, quick to listen to those around us and, you know, slow to speak and slow to anger, but so much more, Lord, when we come to you. Help us to be more attentive to you, Lord. Your word that brings us eternal life, Father. I pray for those hearts here that are perhaps deceived this morning, Lord. Deceived that they can't find help and strength through you and your word. Perhaps deceived that they know better than your word, Lord, than you. Father, we lift them into your hands and pray you'd soften their hearts, that you'd bind the enemy who has deceived their minds and blinded them. I pray for those who are walking strongly and deeply in you as well, Lord Jesus that you would just firm them up in their faith, Lord, reveal your presence to them so much more deeply. Draw us all near to you in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.